Book Two, Sections Five through Six of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Two, Sections Five through Six. Section Five. Next, let us consider what should be our arrangements about property. Should the citizens of the perfect state have their possessions in common or not? This question may be discussed separately from the enactments about women and children, even supposing that the women and children belong to individuals, according to the customs which is at present universal. May there not be an advantage in having and using possessions in common? Three cases are possible. 1. The soil may be appropriated, but the produce may be thrown for consumption into the common stock, and this is the practice of some nations. Or 2. The soil may be common and may be cultivated in common, but the produce divided among individuals for their private use. This is a form of common property which is said to exist among certain barbarians. Or three, the soil and the produce may be alike common. When the husbandmen are not the owners, the case will be different and easier to deal with. But when they till the ground for themselves, the question of ownership will give a world of trouble. If they do not share equally enjoyments and toils, those who labor much and get little will necessarily complain of those who labor little and receive or consume much. But indeed there is always a difficulty in men living together and having all human relations in common, but especially in their having common property. The partnerships of fellow travelers are an example to the point, for they generally fall out over everyday matters and quarrel about any trifle which turns up. So with servants we are most able to take offense at those with whom we most frequently come into contact in daily life. These are only some of the disadvantages which attend the community of property. The present arrangement, if improved, as it might be by good customs and laws, would be far better, and would have the advantages of both systems. Property should be in a certain sense common, but, as a general rule, private, for when every one has a distinct interest, men will not complain of one another and they will make more progress, because every one will be attending to his own business. And yet by reason of goodness and in respect of use, friends, as the proverb says, will have all things in common. Even now there are traces of such a principle showing that it is not impracticable, but in well-ordered states, exist already to a certain extent, and may be carried further. For although every man has his own property, some things he will place at the disposal of his friends, while of others he shares the use with them. The Lacedaemonians, for example, use one another's slaves and horses and dogs, as if they were their own, and when they lack provisions on a journey, they appropriate what they will find in the fields throughout the country. It is clearly better that property should be private, but the use of it common and the special business of the legislator is to create in men this benevolent disposition. Again, how immeasurably greater is the pleasure when a man feels a thing to be his own. For surely the love of self is a feeling implanted by nature and not given in vain, although selfishness is rightly censured. This, however, is not the mere love of self, but the love of self in excess, like the miser's love of money. For all, or almost all, men love money and other such objects in a measure. And further, there is the greatest pleasure in doing a kindness or service to friends or guests or companions, which can only be rendered when a man has private property. These advantages are lost by excessive unification of the state. The exhibition of two virtues, besides, is visibly annihilated in such a state. First, temperance towards women for it is an honorable action to abstain from another's wife for temperance sake. Secondly, liberality in the matter of property. No one, when men have all things in common, will any longer set an example of liberality or do any liberal action, for liberality consists in the use which is made of property, 
Such legislation may have a specious appearance of benevolence. Men readily listen to it, and are easily induced to believe that in some wonderful manner everybody will become everybody's friend, especially when someone is heard denouncing the evils now existing in states, suits about contracts, convictions for perjury, flatteries of rich man and the like, which are said to arise out of the possession of private property. These evils, however, are due to a very different cause, the wickedness of human nature. Indeed, we see that there is much more quarreling among those who have all things in common, though there are not many of them when compared with the vast numbers who have private property. Again, we ought to reckon not only the evils from which the citizens will be saved, but also the advantages which they will lose. The life which they are to lead appears to be quite impracticable. The error of Socrates must be attributed to the false notion of unity from which he starts. Unity there should be, both of the family and of the state, but in some respects only. For there is a point at which a state may attain such a degree of unity as to be no longer a state, or at which, without actually ceasing to exist, it will become an inferior state. Like the harmony passing into unison, or rhythm which has been reduced to a single foot. The state, as I was saying, is a plurality which should be united and made into a community by education, and it is strange that the author of a system of education which he thinks will make the state virtuous should expect to improve his citizens by regulations of this sort, and not by philosophy or by customs and laws, like those which prevail at Sparta and Crete respecting common meals, whereby the legislator has made property common. Let us remember that we should not disregard the experience of ages. In the multitude of years these things, if they were good, would certainly not have been unknown. For almost everything has been found out, although sometimes they are not put together. In other cases men do not use the knowledge which they have. Great light would be thrown on this subject if we could see such a form of government in the actual process of construction. For the legislator could not form a state at all without distributing and dividing its constituents into associations for common meals, and into fratries and tribes. But all this legislation ends only in forbidding agriculture to the guardians, a prohibition which the Lacedaemonians try to enforce already. But indeed Socrates has not said, nor is it easy to decide, what in such a community will be the general form of the state? The citizens who are not guardians are the majority, and about them nothing has been determined. Are the husbandmen too to have their property in common, or is each individual to have his own, and are the wives and children to be individual or common? If, like the guardians, they are to have all things in common, what do they differ from them, or what will they gain by submitting to their government? Or upon what principle would they submit, unless indeed the governing class adopt the ingenious policy of the Cretans, who give their slaves the same institutions as their own, but forbid them gymnastic exercises and the possession of arms? If, on the other hand, the inferior classes are to be like other cities in respect of marriage and property, what will be the form of the community? Must it not contain two states in one? each hostile to the other he makes the guardians into a mere occupying garrison, while the husbandmen and artisans and the rest are the real citizens. But if so the suits and quarrels, and all the evils which Socrates affirms to exist in other states, will exist equally among them. He says indeed that, having so good an education, the citizens will not need many laws. For example, laws about the city or about the markets but then he confines his education to the guardians. Again he makes the husbandmen owners of the property, upon condition of their paying a tribute. But in that case they are likely to be more unmanageable and conceited than the helots or penistae, or slaves in general, and whether community of wives and property be necessary for the lower equally with the higher class or not, and the questions akin to this, what will be the education, form of government, laws of the lower class, Socrates has nowhere determined. Neither is it easy to discover this, nor is their character of small importance if the common life of the guardians is to be maintained. 
Again, if Socrates makes the women common and retains private property, the men will see to the fields, but who will see to the house? And who will do so if the agricultural class have both their property and their wives in common? Once more, it is absurd to argue, from the analogy of the animals, that men and women should follow the same pursuits, for animals have not to manage a household. The government, too, as constituted by Socrates, contains elements of danger, for he makes the same persons always rule. And if this is often a case of disturbance among the meaner sort, how much more among high-spirited warriors? But that the persons whom he makes rulers must be the same is evident, for the gold which the god mingles in the souls of men is not at one time given to one, at another time to another, but always to the same. As he says, God mingles gold in some, and silver in others, from their very birth. But brass and iron in those who are meant to be artisans and husbandmen. Again he deprives the guardians even of happiness, and says that the legislator ought to make the whole state happy. But the whole cannot be happy unless most or all, or some of its parts, enjoy happiness. In this respect happiness is not like the even principle in numbers, which may exist only in the whole, but in neither of the parts. Not so happiness. And if the guardians are not happy, who are? Surely not the artisans or the common people. The republic of which Socrates discourses has all these difficulties, and others quite as great. Section 6 The same or nearly the same objections apply to Plato's later work, The Laws, and therefore we had better examine briefly the constitution which is therein described. In the Republic, Socrates has definitely settled in all a few questions only, such as the community of women and children, the community of property, and the constitution of the state. The population is divided into two classes, one of husbandmen and the other of warriors. From this latter is taken a third class of counselors and rulers of the state. But Socrates has not determined whether the husbandmen and artisans are to have a share in the government, and whether they too are to carry arms and share in military service or not. He certainly thinks that the women ought to share in the education of the guardians and to fight by their side. The remainder of the work is filled up with digressions foreign to the main subject and with discussions about the education of the guardians. In the laws there is hardly anything but laws but much is said about the Constitution. This, which he had intended to make more of the ordinary type, he gradually brings round to the other or ideal form. For with the exception of the community of women and property, he supposes everything to be the same in both states. There is to be the same education. The citizens of both are to live free from servile occupations, and there are to be common meals in both. The only difference is that in the laws the common meals are extended to women, and the warriors number five thousand, but in the republic only one thousand. The discourses of Socrates are never commonplace. They always exhibit grace and originality and thought, but perfection in everything can hardly be expected. We must not overlook the fact that the number of five thousand citizens just now mentioned will require a territory as large as Babylon, or some other huge site, if so many persons are to be supported in idleness, together with their women and attendants, who will be a multitude many times as great. In framing an ideal we may assume what we wish, but should avoid impossibilities. It is said that the legislator ought to have his eyes directed to two points, the people and the country. But neighboring countries also must not be forgotten by him, firstly because the state for which he legislates is to have a political and not an isolated life, for a state must have such a military force as will be serviceable against her neighbors, and not merely useful at home. Even if the life of action is not admitted to be the best, either for individuals or states, still a city should be formidable to enemies, whether invading or retreating. There is another point. Should not the amount of property be defined in some way which differs from this by being clearer? For Socrates says that a man should have so much property as will enable him to live temperately, 
which is only a way of saying to live well. This is too general a conception. Further, a man may live temperately and yet miserably. A better definition would be that a man must have so much property as will enable him to live not only temperately, but liberally. If the two are parted, liberally will combine with luxury. Temperance will be associated with toil. For liberality and temperance are the only eligible qualities which have to do with the use of property. A man cannot use property with mildness or courage, but temperately and liberally he may, and therefore the practice of these virtues is inseparable from property. There is an inconsistency, too, in equalizing the property and not regulating the number of the citizens. The population is to remain unlimited, and he thinks that it will be sufficiently equalized by a certain number of marriages being unfruitful. However, many are born to others, because he finds this to be the case in existing states. But greater care will be required than now, for among ourselves, whatever may be the number of citizens, the property is always distributed among them, and therefore no one is in want. But if the property were incapable of division, as in the laws, the supernumeraries, whether few or many, would get nothing. One would have thought that it was even more necessary to limit population than property, and that the limit should be fixed by calculating the chances of mortality in the children, and of the sterility in married persons. The neglect of this subject which in existing states is so common, is a never-failing cause of poverty among the citizens. And poverty is the parent of revolution and crime. Phidon, the Corinthian, who was one of the most ardent legislators, thought that the families and the number of citizens ought to remain the same, although originally all the lots may have been of different sizes. But in the laws the opposite principle is maintained. What, in our opinion, is the right arrangement will have to be explained hereafter. There is another omission in the laws. Socrates does not tell us how the rulers differ from their subjects. He only says that they should be related as the warp and the wolf, which are made out of different wools. He allows that a man's whole property may be increased fivefold, but why should not his land also increase to a certain extent? Again, will the good management of a household be promoted by his arrangement of homesteads? For he assigns to each individual two homesteads in separate places, and it is difficult to live in two houses. The whole system of government tends to be neither democracy nor oligarchy, but something in a mean between them, which is usually called a polity, and is composed of the heavy-armed soldiers. Now, if he intended to frame a constitution which would suit the greatest number of states, he was very likely right, but not if he meant to say that this constitutional form came nearest to his first or ideal state, for many would prefer the Lacedaemonian, or possibly some other more aristocratic government. Some indeed say that the best constitution is a combination of all existing forms, and they praise the Lacedaemonian because it is made up of oligarchy, monarchy, and democracy, the king forming the monarchy, and the council of elders the oligarchy, while the democratic element is represented by the ephors, for the ephors are selected from the people. Others, however, declare that ephorality to be a tyranny, and find the element of democracy in the common meals and in the habits of daily life. In the laws it is maintained that the best constitution is made up of democracy and tyranny, which are either not constitutions at all, or are the worst of all. But they are nearer the truth who combine many forms. For the constitution is better which is made up of more numerous elements. The constitution proposed in the laws has no element of monarchy at all. It is nothing but oligarchy and democracy, leaning rather to oligarchy. This is seen in the mode of appointing magistrates, for although the appointment of them by lot from among those who have been already selected combines both elements, the way in which the rich are compelled by law to attend the assembly and vote for magistrates or discharge other political duties, while the rest may do as they like, and the endeavor to have the greater number of the magistrates appointed out of the richer classes and the highest officers selected from those who have the greatest incomes, both these are oligarchical features. 
the oligarchical principle prevails also in the choice of the council for all are compelled to choose but the compulsion extends only to the choice out of the first class and of an equal number out of the second class and out of the third class but not in this latter case to all the voters but to those of the first three classes and the selection of candidates out of the fourth class is only compulsory on the first and second then from the person so chosen he says that there ought to be an equal number of each class selected thus a preponderance will be given to the better sort of people who have the larger incomes because many of the lower classes not being compelled will not vote these considerations and others which will be adduced when the time comes for examining similar polities tend to show that states like plato's should not be composed of democracy and monarchy there is also a danger in electing the magistrates out of the body who are themselves elected for if but a few small number choose to combine the elections will always go as they desire such is the constitution which is described in the laws end of book 2 sections 5 and 6